All right, so we are moving here through Thomas Pynchon's novel V, and we're up to chapter 11, The Confessions of Fausto Maestro. Uh, now, this is a manuscript that has been given to Paolo Maestro by her father, um, uh, who uh, pa Paolo was born um, on the island of Malta. And um, the story is a sort of autobiography of Fausto Maestro, her father, in which he discusses um, sort of four different iterations of his personality, which he labels Fausto I, Fausto II, Fausto III, and Fausto IV. Fausto I simply consists of Fausto in his life on Malta, uh, be becoming a priest, uh, becoming a Catholic priest, and before the war hits. Uh, and then Fausto II begins with the, um, with the conception of Paolo when he gets a woman named Elena Jemshi uh, pr uh, pregnant. And uh, notice that her name is Elena. Uh, Faust, the character of Faust in Goethe's Faust, um, brings up Helen, Helen of Troy at one point, and then produces a son with her named Euphorion, a boy which uh, tries to fly and then takes a plunge, a sort of suicidal plunge uh, into the abyss and meets with a bad fate. So her name is Elena. He gets her pregnant and decides he doesn't want to be a priest. And this becomes Fausto II, is raising the child on this island um, and the beginnings of the bombings, um, the sieges, of uh, the Germans are constantly bombing Malta with Messerschmitt airplanes. And so we constantly get this sense of this uh, air raid sirens are going off all of the time. But the children are having fun. Gangs of sort of wild, almost feral children are running around in the rocks, getting into trouble, uh, having fun. You know, like the kid does in Steven Spielberg's Empire of the Sun, uh, where the war to him isn't traumatic. It's just a fun big game that the adults are playing. Uh, and so, um, and then uh, Fausto III uh, is the death of Elena during one of the bombing runs, and uh, the central image and whole point of the chapter comes with the death of V. So that this chapter is chronologically, of all the V chapters, it's chronologically the latest. It takes place, uh, in, or it ends in 19, 1943 on Malta, which is where we see her dismantled by a, a crowd of feral children, who pull her apart, and Paolo Maestral is one of these individuals who, who perform this disassembly. Uh, so those are the four, and then the fourth iteration of Fausto is simply the, the Fausto of the present writing this uh, autobiography and quoting from earlier journals. He has these offset block quotes from earlier uh, journals, iterations of his earlier self, where he had ambitions as a literary man, along with two friends of his, Marat and uh, Danubi Etna, and um, who are fans of T.S. Eliot, and they see themselves as a poetic uh, circle, uh, kind of analogous to Pound and Yeats and Eliot, that sort of world. And um, so then um, the chapter now, there's a, an alternation that has been going on all through the novel uh, between what Pynchon calls the surface world of the street and then uh, the world under the street and now the surface world of the street is the world of surfaces, the world of the exterior realm, which is being invaded by the inanimate, uh, especially through the course of World War II. Uh, the inanimate is spreading, and there's no real place to go except under the street, as they do here on this island during these bombing raids. They're constantly forced to take shelter. Um, and Malta is a place of stone. Uh, um, stone is the overriding image of it. It goes... There's a very strong Neolithic bedrock to it that goes back to uh, these great temples, uh, temple tombs that were built on the island from about 3600 BC down to about 1500 BC uh, at uh, Gigantia and um, House Afliani and Tarshian. Uh, these early temples in which um, they actually, a lot of these temples, not all of them, some of them are built above ground uh, and they're part of the megalith culture, the, the whole Mediterranean megalith culture. Um, and they didn't have metals, actually, so they're carving these stones and then burrowing into the rock uh, to produce these great, what are called hypogea, these great burial uh, wombs, basically, with lots of goddess imagery. And the Maltese favored uh, the, the fat goddess, the plump goddess. We find lots of images of sculptures of her in the fat plump mode that originated, actually, in Paleolithic Europe. Um, and so uh, this is a culture that's... The sort of it's, it's an earth burrowing culture. It's a stone culture, truly a neo uh, stone age culture. 
and um, and it was a culture of the goddess. And so it's appropriate that V meets her end here on, on precisely this island. Now, the opposition between surface and street was something that we saw right at the beginning of the novel when Profane goes down below into the sewer system to hunt alligators. Uh, it's, it's in the world below that's the only realm uh, where the human soul now in V can find nourishment since it is being dehumanized in the world up, up above. And um, Pynchon also has in mind de Chirico's famous painting, uh, Mystery and Melancholy of a Street, as a, a symbol for the surface world, that yellow painting with a perspectival vanishing point uh, with a girl chasing what looks like a hula hoop a, as a shadow. And, um, and then so um, there's also this image that I had neglected to mention in the chapter in which uh, Godolphin, Hugh Godolphin, the explorer, was telling uh, V about uh, and, uh, V. Haisu and his, uh, and then also Antarctica and, and the possibility that from Antarctica there are these beings living at the South Pole who are tunneling their way up to the surface world. They're going, they're actually going through the core of the Earth, and V. Haisu would be one of the egress points uh, out of which they would come. Uh, to, to sort of invade the earth. So there's always this image of the world below in V and the world above. And the world above is running down. Entropy is taking its claim there and is becoming thermodynamically uh, exhausted of its possibilities as it is invaded and exhausted um, by the inanimate. And then, uh, so now, um, so we have all these images of the, the world below, and there's a quote, a direct quote from in this chapter on page, I think it's 359, where uh, in his uh, Fausto's journals he says, but in dream there are two worlds, the street and under the street. He says, one is the kingdom of death, and that turns out to be the surface world and one of life, and that turns out to be the underworld. It's a little bit analogous to Egyptian myth, in which the upper world is the realm of the sun and the god Ray, uh, the sun god Ray, who, who goes across the sky and then becomes exhausted when the sun sets. And then he can only be regenerated by, by going to Amenti, the world that is below the earth, where he encounters the throne of Osiris, who is the god of regeneration and rebirth. All things green originate from his body um, and regenerates him. Uh, so he's regenerated. Ray, the sun god, is regenerated uh, by the earth god uh, down below and then comes out. Uh, refreshed for the next day. Uh, it's a little bit analogous to that. And then so uh, Fausto tells his, his tale then of uh, falling in love with Elena, uh, getting her pregnant, then realizing he doesn't want to be a priest, um, but that there is a rival priest on the island called the Bad Priest. And this is, of course, V in disguise as a priest. By this point, she's in her 60s, um, and she's wearing a wide-brimmed hat, uh, carefully concealing her hair, uh, or a wig, actually, as we find out it's a wig. And um, she's the bad priest, and at one point she encounters Elena and tells her to abort the baby, which is Paolo Maestro. Tells her to get rid of the baby. Uh, this is one of the reasons why she's called the bad priest. And the kids follow her around, or they think it's a, a man, uh, until the very last image, uh, which is that of almost kind of a crucifixion scene. And then, uh, so we follow this uh, story um, in the iterations of Fausto, and then we get to really the the best part of this chapter, and one of the key images of the book, is the, the death of V, which now takes place in a cellar. So it takes place underground after a bombing raid has ha already taken place, uh, and it's down in a cellar in which V lies on the ground pinned by a beam that is over her. So it's an image of a crucifixion, although it's a, a crucifixion not with two beams, a vertical and a horizontal beam, but simply with one beam lying across her body, pinning her to the floor. She's wearing her black priest outfit with the hat and um, the children show up and the father Fausto is spying on them through chinks in the broken masonry and he's looking at them uh, and he sees these kids gather around her in a circle and she's begging for them to help her and they start pulling things from her body they take off her hat and then uh, this long white hair spills out and they and they say oh it's not a man it's a woman look but then they tug on that and it turns out to be a wig so that V now has a bald head on the top of which has been tattooed an image of the crucifixion. So Pynchon wants you to know that this is his, his version of the crucifixion here, the death of V. And um, then one of the kids starts pulling, fooling with her feet and they find out that the feet are prostheses, they're detachable. So they remove the feet 
uh, and then they tear the robe off, and then she is wearing in her navel uh, a sapphire um, in the shape of a star that has somehow been impressed into her navel. And one of the kids with a bayonet pries it loose from her navel, and she starts bleeding to death as the result of this. And um, then they take out her, she has false teeth. It doesn't say this, but it's implied that it's the false teeth of eigenvalues that he had in his office in which each one of the different teeth uh, was made of a different metal. So they ply that out. And we know this is V uh, only because of two details, really. One is that she still has the ivory comb. They pull an ivory comb out of the wig uh, that we had seen earlier was a comb of four crucified British uh, soldiers. They pull that out of the wig. And then she still has the left eyeball that's in the shape of a clock. Uh, and they pry that out of her head. Um, so they completely tear her apart. And she's basically lying there bleeding to death. And the kids run away and scatter. And then Fausto comes out to give her last rites. He still remembers um, all the his liturgy and so forth from his rituals as a Catholic priest. He gives her the last rites, but he doesn't have anything to anoint her body for burial, so he uses her blood and sort of sponges her uh, with it, drizzles it all over her. And uh, that's it for V. Chronologically, there are still a couple more V chapters, one that loops back to 1913 in Paris with V in love, uh, and then uh, one or two more after that. Uh, but chronologically, this is this is the end of V. This is where she meets her sad end. Uh, note that it takes place in the world below. In other words, V is disentangled from the inanimate, in a certain sense rescued from the inanimate in the world below. This, what's below the street, not the above world, which is where she has spent the entire narrative fusing, like Darth Vader in the Star Wars films, fusing her body with an exoskeleton of the inanimate. Um, now, Pynchon, or rather Profane, in the first chapter had had a dream uh, where he too underwent a, dis uh, a disassembly. He had a dream that um, he had a golden screw in his navel instead of the sapphire that V has. He had a golden screw, and then at some point uh, he was able to get a screwdriver to unscrew it, and then it says that his, his ass fell off. He basically falls apart, uh, but it takes place at street level. That, in that, that's in the end of the, uh, chapter one. It takes place at street level. Whereas this uh, takes place in the world below, Pynchon's uh, semiotics of the world below, which is the only place apparently now where some kind of regeneration can come to the Western mind and the Western soul uh, to redeem it from its entrapping, its sort of Gnostic fall into the prison of the exoskeletal shell of technology within which modern man has fallen and which has dehumanized him and reduced him to all the various atrocities, as we've seen of the 20th century, with the world wars, the bombing runs, the atom bomb, genocide, ethnic cleansing, you name it, we did it in this in this century, the, the most inhuman, dehumanizing century perhaps in the entire history of humanity. Uh, and it cannot be an accident that it came uh, in conjunction with what Siegfried Gideon got, uh, called in his book, mechanization takes command. That's the same idea here. Um, so that's basically it for this chapter. Um, and then uh, next we'll move on to chapter 12 with another one of the uh, uh, profane episodes.